Okay, it can be hard for the listener to kind of understand what's going on. Danny, have you anything to throw in there on tip one? I, uh, I suppose what I would say if you are writing that possibly the use of a narrator or a storyteller can join the action part together. So in other words, if you use a narrator or a storyteller who can move the story forward quicker than it can be acted out. Now that's a good little trick to use if you are writing the play. So it means you start to lay out your characters and you lay out the scene, but to move to the next scene, if you have to get the actors to do it, it can take a while, whereas a narrator can cut through that and basically you're on to the next scene. It also gives a different aspect to the writing because the narrator will just be joining it to be a kind of a catalyst, joining the pieces, whereas the actors then, like you know when you go to the actors that it's action, it's happening, whereas the narrator is just moving the narrative along. Other than that, I'd say you're doing fine, Mike. Work away. All right, we'll go on to point two. So just back, just back, just back to Darmoret. Uh, okay, so point two lads a good tip would be write something that's personal to you you know think think of what you're trying to tell the world uh why does it matter write about something personal to you write about the world you know so i suppose what that means basically lads in a nutshell if you're going writing a play um or even acting the play you know um especially for writing make sure you know about the topic to try writing you know like there'd be no point me and my commander going away and writing something about uh, a play about specifically about farming because i'm not a farmer you know and Sometimes that does come across, you know, if you don't know about what you're really about, or even if you're acting about, you know, sometimes that, you know, you can kind of tell a lot when people might be un uncomfortable um, when you hear their when you hear their voice, and as well as that, the story doesn't come across as well. So just just be kind of just be mindful when you're writing something that you do know, I suppose, what you're writing about, or that you do a good bit of research before you write, and the same with acting, you know, and. Good drama is not simply about one idea, but about what happens when two ideas collide. You know, 30 minutes give you a, a long time to develop your plot and your subplot. So like I said in the last clip, like two kind of storylines is kind of enough, but one, ma one main storyline and one subplot, you know, um, you, you know, uh, any more after that, you know, you're, you're complicating things. And unless it's really well put together, it, it can be very confusing for the listeners and for the judges, you know. Danny, what, have you anything to say on that? Yeah, I would say, you know, Look, if you have a story to tell, it's fantastic. Like, it, it's more believable. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create believability, but you're, you're telling the story as opposed to demonstrating it. It's more telling the story. Um, and I would say a, a trap not to fall into, it probably with the younger people, because it's a young age group we're using with, it's probably not a major problem. But a lot of playwrights tend to rely a lot on nostalgic items or nostalgia to bring a likability to the play. A bit of nostalgia is fantastic, but it really only works if you have an actual genuine story going on and a bit of nostalgia coming into it can make it a beautiful play. So just a little tip there that if you want to, you know, put in, put in a bit of nostalgia, it's fine, but don't depend on it to carry the play. Right? Okay, uh, point three we come up with lads is vary the pace and length of your scenes. Uh, a radio play which has five ten minute scenes each set in a, in a den room is likely to be less effective than a play which varies its scenes and settings. And using a variety of background scene lengths and sound effects will usually make the story uh, more effective for the listener. So stuff like that, you know, um, if you're if you're if you're doing a scene there indoors and I suppose it's set in the kitchen or that, don't be afraid to use a, an old sound effect. Now and again, maybe a kettle boiling or the television on. If you're outside in the scene, you know, you know, if you're if you're near if the scene is set near a road, have a have a car passing or a tractor passing or have traf have some bit of traffic passing, you know, because using the the sound effects can really bring the play to life and it can really uh, it can really give you a good mental picture. Of, of, what, of what the actors are trying to, and the race are trying to achieve, you know? Yeah, all I, all I said there is, and I'll cover it later, basically 
because it's radio, you're basically giving a vocal and emotional response to the text. You're not really giving a physical response. So, you know, there are all good points there from Mike. Um, for make, make sure the structure keeps them listening. So, so big thing in the play, um, especially for radio, is think about your middle, or sorry, your beginning, middle and end uh, to your play. Think about what will grab the audience in the first 10 pages. And then as the play unfolds, what, what they should keep listening. Um, I didn't think about how your play develops and uh, it changes and the pace changes throughout the middle of the play and how it is resolved. Use the element of surprise. Um, audience can begin listening at different points throughout the play. So you need to think about what will hook them in throughout the story and, and uh, what will keep them interested to the end. So it's about variation, lads. It's about, you know, when you if you are going to write a play, you know, especially for someone that's going to write a play, especially for someone that's never written one before, think about your start, your middle and your end and think about of, of the journey of how you're going to get there, you know? And, and we're saying use the elements of surprise, you know, that can be anything from the way your voice to sound effects, whatever, you know, but it's important to, as I said before, to engage the audience, you know, and after the first couple of pages, you really need to start, I suppose, setting the scene or you could lose the, you could lose the audience, you know? Yeah. It, it's really, I suppose, and another part in that, and they're all very relevant, if it's a serious subject, and a lot of plays tend to be, especially Irish plays, tend to be kind of serious or a bit down, you know, downtrodden, etc. It, it's very effective to lighten it in places. In other words, lift the mood of the play so that when you get to the serious bit, it's more effective. And as Mike said, you know, audiences love a good twist in a play and you needn't tell them too much of the story. It can come out of nowhere at times but basically to have contrast within it. Yeah. As I, I'll cover that again now in a second with one or two of the other points anyway. All right, Mike? Yeah. Get under the skin of the characters. Um, just, to, just to wind back a tiny bit, if you are picking an existing play, because I, I, I don't think every group will write a play, it would be fantastic if they did, if there's someone that would. But if you're picking or uh, adapting an existing play, um, most of the above rules, you need to pick something that has a start, the middle, and finish. You need something, you know, that you can develop the characters, and you also have to probably pick a play that doesn't have any obstacles or that the given circumstances aren't over because you don't have a visual aspect to it as such. So that's probably the challenge, it's to pick a play. My tip would probably be to pick a play that doesn't have that many characters. I know you want to involve as many people as possible. But when people are listening, um, the less complex in a way is good. Now I know you come back to scoring and all that and you say, no, we need it to be more complex. But you know, perfection is a lot of little things done right. And I think if you do all the little things right, that the whole thing comes together. Uh, so the trick is do what you can do and do it to the best of the, of the ability. So basically getting under the skin of your characters, get to know them really well. Now, this is whether you're writing it or whether uh, you've written it yourselves here doing another play. Each will have their own individual speech mannerisms, right? And don't have them all speaking from your tone of voice if you wrote it like have them have their own so i suppose really what i would say is you know get let the, let each character know each actor should know their mood in the piece and if their mood changes in the piece now if they're a side in the play they might have to start the play side or they might have to finish the play side they might only need to be really sad at one point of it and it actually works stronger if you can have contrast. And I would always advise directors or groups to highlight, like recognize the differences between your characters and highlight that because contrast is way more entertaining than similarity. Like if they're all the same, it kind of can get a bit boring. It doesn't matter which one of them is speaking, but if there is differences, it's very good. Also, and it's great fun as a group when you're practicing, consider if the play requires it using accents. Now, the first night you'll do and people feel funny and all that, but it can actually add to the fun. 
and really led in these times, there's probably a bit of fun we need. You could be doing a murder mystery, you could be doing whatever kind of a play, but like accents can be very, very, very enjoyable if one of the characters or two of the characters have an, has an accent. All right? It might only be colloquial accents, but you'll be surprised. But accents, be careful if you're doing them. You need an actor that can deliver them and they need to stay in the accent for the duration okay. of the play. All right. Okay, sorry, yeah. okay. okay, number six. Express your characters between dialogue and interaction. If you have one central character, think about how you can express through dialogue and interaction with other characters rather than them talking out loud for long periods. I suppose really what you're saying there is rather than they have a big bulk together, it's called a monologue for the actor, right? And a monologue is a tool or a system you can write it in monologue form where each person has these big chunks to deliver. But unless you have an awful lot of color in your, in your voice and unless you're you know, well accomplished, monologues can get quite boring. So basically it's better to have interaction between the characters, right? And have them talking out loud to each other rather than one of them talking for an awful long time. Now you may at one point in the play have the main character and he might or she might have a bit of a speech, but that's only to deliver home the final message of the play. Don't have, don't have characters telling each other information they already know, even if it seems to be furthering the plot. I suppose that's a very good point. And the other thing I'd add to that is um, that you don't have to join all the dots of the audience, you know? Even if they go home with one or two, if they turn off and they've listened to the play and they're wondering, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened to the baby, whatever it is. So it, it, it can often be quite good not to join all the dots in the story and leave some questions. All right. So that's if you're writing it. Even if you pick a play, one that leaves a few questions in the audience, it creates suspense. It's, it's probably not a bad idea. Anything to add there, Mike? Yeah, well, I suppose just on monologues, if, if someone has to do a monologue in a play, I suppose, just remember to, I suppose, if possible, to maybe uh, do a variation in your voice when you're, when you're delivering the monologue. Like, if you're saying the monologue in the same tone, when you, you know, um, it can get quite boring. If, it, if there's an opportunity to maybe, you know, to maybe um, change the way you're saying the monologue halfway through, do because, you know, sometimes there you see plays and there could be monologue of 10 to 15 lines. And if you're saying it in the same tone, People will lose. People will lose what you're saying after after within a minute or two, and it can get a bit boring. So if it does allow you. Uh, just bear that in mind, you know. Yeah. All right. Um, and I suppose that leads nicely to our next piece. Use the four building blocks: speech, sound effects, music, and silence. Now I'm going to deal with the last one first. Silence is probably one of the most powerful tools, especially if you're creating tension or suspense. And sometimes it can be more powerful than nothing. Or you'll say, well, you can't have 30 seconds of silence in the middle of a play. No, but you can have, you can use pause and you can use silence to great effect. So don't be afraid of silence, right? Speech, and this comes back to the monologue or whatever, right? A monologue well delivered is fantastic, but really, when you're doing the play, whether you're doing one that was written by the group or by someone, or a play that you're using that you've got from another playwright, the color in a radio play is created by the color in the person's speech. So they'll use pace, pause, pitch. They can vary their speech. They can speed it up, slow it down, add a laugh, add humor, you know, that kind of breathing is very important. Like you can let, you can let the audience know your mood. Like if we are, oh, you know, you know that I'm not enjoying this or it's boring or whatever, right? So you can add the color by using speech. And likewise, when you're picking your actors, and we all know actors, oh, he's great stage presence. Stage presence is very, very valuable in a radio play. So you actually become sharper from uh, an audio point of view. So really, the people who have well-spoken voices, and I wouldn't be including myself in that, would be people who would shine from an acting point of view in a radio play, right? 
sound effects. Effects are very, very powerful. And I'm gonna use the word here, ambience, right? I was involved in a play, I was directing it, and it was set totally outdoors on the side of a hill, outdoors, two farmers in the play, right? And for the 54 minutes that play was at the time, for the 54 minutes of the play, there was a sound of birds and the odd dog barking and things like that. So there was a, a, what I would call an ambience sound effect. Now, you probably didn't notice it, but it was there. So if it's noticeable or if it's interfering, then it's too loud. So be very careful at how you pitch your sound effects. And I would say whatever sound effects you're using, if there's a sheep or if there's cows or if there's a dog barking or whatever, if there's a car arriving, it has to be realistic in terms of its pitch and volume of it. But great idea from a point of view. Like if you go back to when, we, when, when I was young, you might even have been born in Jaws, the film Jaws, without the music in the background, right? I don't think the shark would have been, or the Jaws would have been half as frightening, all right? So music is a sound effect as well, right? Now you can underscore certain pieces, you can underscore romantic pieces, but I think the most important part of music in a play is the music that you use for your opening scene. So you open the play with a bit of music, but that music should set the mood for the play, right? Like if you come on and you play the birdie song and it turns out to be a play about a fellow with cancer, it's, it's probably not fitting it. Do you know what I'm saying? So we, I would think the opening music, you also how you close the play, whether it's a snap ending, whether it's a shot ending, it could be just a play that ends with a gunshot and pure silence, right? But if you are using music at the end, then that should reflect the end of the play. It, it can also be used to bookend the start of it. So these are really the important bits, whether it's a play you wrote or not, you have to make every possible use of sound effects, etc. cetera. Um, and as I say, don't be afraid to lighten it and have a bit of laughter in there, even in a very serious subject. All right. Mike, you might have something to add to that now. Yeah, well, I suppose just on the music, lads, I suppose if you can use music from that time period at your place, says, as well, it can be quite effective as well, you know. And obviously, if we're, if we're, if we're doing a play from the 70s, or you're saying the 70s or 80s, and then during the play, you're using music from the 90s or 2000s, obviously that's a big no-no from a judge's point of view. And it's right what Danny said, music can have great effects. Like, if anyone remembers the original Halloween movie with Jamie Lee Curtis, when that went to the... With that, just an example, when I went to the, the studios, um, it went without the music originally, and the studios thought it was a pile of crap, and nobody would take it up. But when um, when the music was added to that uh, film, you know, did 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 did, like uh, one um, one one studio executive said it scared the bejesus out of her. Well, I'm saying that in a nice way for what she said. So music is so so important, lads. Um, as Danny said, like if you've a play that opens at a fast tempo, that's something something's happening. Like a play like the Hitchhiker now or something like that, you know. Have had that had that music to match it, you know. Um, if it's a play that kind of opens nice and calm, nice and calm music, because it really it really paints the a picture for even the people listening to the play uh, straight up, you know. Yeah, just one other thing to finish off that section. If you're doing a play which is of a historical nature, or if it's about a person who's in existence today, if you do a play about Donald Trump, or if you do a play about whatever, right? You probably have to time stamp it, which you can do with music. And you also have to be as, try and be as historically or factually accurate as possible. I know I know the play might be called fake news and you can do what you like there, but if it's not about him, then I would say if it's about a real person, then you try and respect the, the, the facts about that person. Now, after that, then you can add your own dramatic effects, etc. All right, we move on to the next one there, number eight, to express... Uh, Oh, 
Okay, we move to, right. Just before we move on, a very good point brought up by Molly there uh, inadvertently probably. Because the actors don't really have to learn the lines off by heart. No, they have to really feel them and understand them. But because they don't have to learn them off by heart, the one thing you don't want in your recording is pages turning. If I was adjudicating it and I had pages turning, that would bug me, you know? So just be very careful that when they are recording, if they are using the script, that they're not turning pages, you know, in the middle of it, unless it happens to be set in a library or whatever. All right. Um, Number eight, express the visual elements in a subtle way. Uh, this is probably a tip for the group or for the director, I suppose, in a way. And that is, you know, how to come over the obstacles that are presented by the given circumstances of a play. And if there's visual elements, which if you pick an existing play that's not necessarily written for, it's being adapted for radio, then you will come across certain things in it where that will appear, right? So think about how you'll express those elements in a subtle way to help the audience imagine the story. Really what you want to do, if this is set in, um, in a field of early in the middle of August and the sun is shining, you want to transport your audience that they are actually picturing this. So when you're telling the story, you're drawing a picture. Um, and that's for all the actors, that's for the group, the ensemble as a whole. So if you have a very visual idea that you want to write, think how without visuals you can make the audience understand that. For example, if a butterfly appears and starts speaking, how is the audience going to know that it's a butterfly? It can work, but the group will have to find a way to establish this clearly. So to me, that's how you, the challenge how you overcome, and that's probably what some of the direction marks or the production marks would go for, would be how you overcome the obstacles of the play. Because every play has um, given circumstances. And you, like the diary of Anne Frank is set in an attic, there's given circumstances that you can't ignore. Or there's, you know, every play, no matter how simple or how complex it is, there's given circumstances. And they pose obstacles for the actors or for the, the director of the team. And you have to come around that. So that's one of the challenges. And I suppose when you're picking the play, you know, you probably have to pick something that's, that is, that it's possible. Or if you're writing it, that it's something that can be performed um, to some level of believability, to be honest about it. All right. Have you got an down, Mike, to add and no, no. take it from there? No? No. All right, you might move on there, so with number nine. Yeah, so concentrate on your presentation. So for um, script readers and play competition judges, this is for us, if you're submitting your own scripts, are better to pose towards neatly tight presented scripts. Type all directions and sound effects in capital letters. That's for that the judge will know, and as well as that, obviously for your own gang as well, like that it's clear. And one thing very important as well to, to, to leave a nice and neat is I leave a space each time a character speaks. And I suppose the second tip I have here, and this is something I learned myself, um, two years ago, I would I think I had 40 plays directed, couldn't write a play because I always tried to start, could never, never finish, but it was a fellow that went to college uh, doing a writing course, gave me this tip, you know, when writing uh, plays, keep going with it until you reach the end, and that will be your first draft. I didn't mean to finish the first draft, have a look at this, go and do, make the changes, changes to it, that's your second draft, and develop this. And since since I got that tip, you know, I've written six plays, uh, one that won the Writers Award in Ballon College two years ago, and it was just that tip there by... Once you start it, just finish it and then go and make your changes. Um, I think that's a very key point because I used to struggle trying to finish a play, but once that kind of once I got that tip, it kind of all became a lot more simpler, really, to be honest, do you know. Yeah, I I would I would agree with Mike there. Um the hardest thing for a playwright, I'm told, is to actually finish the play. Because you never have to show it to anyone until you have finished, right? And no matter how bad it is, if you finish it and you do a second draft, right, or if you give it to somebody then to critique it. Now, there's no point in giving it to someone who's saying, ah, oh, that's great, that's great. You want to give it to someone who's going to say, okay, look, you asked me and I'm going to tell you 
and it might tear shreds off it, uh, and away you go, you know. So um, I would say, yeah, and look, as regards presentation, it goes back to what I said at the start. It's about a load of little things done right, okay? So attention to detail is important. Um, so what's the next, what's up in number 10 there, Mike? What, where are we? Oh, the synopsis of the place. So, so basically, lads, to cut a long story short with this, you know, if, 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 you, if your synopsis is more than one or two lines long, then maybe you need to have another look at the play or the way, because like a synopsis, um, you know, um, it should be down in a short uh, uh, synopsis. It means you haven't quite worked out what the story is. So keep being work, working at it until you have it. Try to write it in one sentence. A synopsis is a description of the plot of your play, not an artistic statement of intent, which is very important because a lot of judges sometimes like to see, you know, when they're presenting the script, sometimes they like to see a little bit of synopsis beforehand, you know. As sometimes as you write the story, make sure you check when you finish that your synopsis reflects your play, all right, which is kind of fairly straightforward, you know. Um, yeah. you know like, like a synopsis, nice and short, lads, if you, if you are giving a synopsis, especially to a adjudicator, because I suppose if you give it to a adjudicator, they read a synopsis and then the play is different, you know. Well, you know, their mind could be, you know, their, you know, their, mind, their mind could be easily swayed of maybe not giving you extra, extra marks in the mark they should have, you know. Yeah, and, and I suppose the other trick is probably not to give everything away in your synopsis. All right, leave, leave a bit of suspense for the the adjudicator as well. Um, I suppose just one or two other tips that I'm going to throw in. I think if you are producing the play out of the group is, uh, doesn't matter how many characters you've in it, I think you have to look at, and this is whether it's for radio or not, you have to look at the relationships between the characters, right? And there's a kind of a, a pendulum that swings, you know, between one character and another. So there's a relationship between the characters, right? and look at the contrast between the characters and, you know, highlight that. And if you have a serious punchline or a serious message to deliver, you can't, don't have 45 minutes of heavy going. Have it that it's light. And then when you hit home with the story, it will be way more effective. All right? So um, do you want to talk about the score, the, the marking system, Mike? Yeah, I suppose, yeah. So lads, look, I suppose the marking system production is 20, direction is 20, acting 45. So they're all kind of standard, I suppose. But I suppose the hardest one, I suppose, is innovation. And I suppose especially no more than ever because it's, it, you know, any innovation you do, you know, it's not, it's not going to be visual. So innovation will always be a big one, especially, and it was always a big one in drama. So Innovation. So when you are doing something, even even if you haven't written the play and you you you've had you've done the play, you know you're doing the play. Think of something outside the box that maybe you can add to the play. It could be something like a sound effect that could, and it could really change the dimension of the play or of the story. So it's very important to think out, outside the box. You know, the production and the direction. You know, I suppose just just make sure that there's a nice flow, there's a nice tempo. You know, the relationships between each character, as Danny said. Um, is, is so important as well, you know. I suppose on the marking system as well, lads, I suppose, even though you don't have to learn the lines because technically you can add the script in front of you, have a very good knowledge of your part because I suppose if if you play back the recording of this and you're listening to myself and Danny talking, you'd easily know that we're reading, um, we're reading the presentation here, you know. And so I have a good knowledge of it, you know. I have rehearsed a good few times because the last thing you want, if you're if a judge is listening to it, there's and they're hearing going, Well, I know for a fact I can hear it in his voice that he's reading it, you know. It's not coming across, you know, which 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 is an important thing. Like so I have a good knowledge of of the play and of your character that you're playing, you know. Yeah, my advice to groups, and especially groups who may have before, okay. I love naturalistic plays or realistic plays. Mike is into this deep dark stuff, like you know, for us killing each other and all that, right? Uh, I I am a lover of the naturalistic, real, what I would call real, you know, people type plays. And normally, when you read those, you'll say, "Oh, they're too simple. They're too simple. They're too simple." But if they're done right, they will win competitions. You know, um, and production and innovation are very much intertwined there. So, like when it comes down to it, the the production aspects and the innovation, like it's it's while the actors will deliver it, 
it, the acting is less than half the maps. So you have to pay attention. It's basically attention to detail. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for groups, right? If they want to put new people in to try to do a bit of acting, they won't be conscious of what they look like. It's only their voice. They, you, do, you have no costumes to worry about. You don't have to build a set, okay? You can create that all that illusion. So it's an opportunity for new groups to get involved. It's an opportunity for existing groups, directors, writers, to write something with a slightly different slant in it. Like if you're writing a play for the stage, you're conscious of where your audience is. If you're writing it for radio, your audience, it's, you're not facing them in any direction. They're all around you. So it, 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 it'll, it'll sharpen everyone existing who are new to it, but the people who've been at it for years will learn a lot by this. I did a, I did a director's course about six years ago down in the University of Limerick during the summer of the Drama League of Ireland. And it was done by a very well-known um, director and playwright and actor, superbly successful guy. And at, on the first day, he asked, I think it was 19 of us in the room, and he asked us what we wanted to achieve from the week. It was a seven-day intense, of course. And I said, I wanted to be able to see a script and a production, you know, through his eyes. Like, if I could see the way he would see it, like, it would make me a better actor or a better director. And on the last day, he asked us, you know... Did we, what did we achieve in the week? And I said, the one thing I learned was that by the end of the week, I didn't want to see it through, to be able to hear it through his ears. Because when we were working on a scene, he would close his eyes because he wanted to hear the truth in the scene. And that's what the radio play is all about. So you have to make the effort or you have to, to build it in such a way that it's believable. But Trust me, it'll benefit you in every way and it can be very, very enjoyable. All right. I see I've said enough now, Mike. You can Yeah, no, so that's like if you're if you're writing the play, lads, enjoy it. And if you're acting yes, and you and if you're directing yes, enjoy the process as well. It's a great learning experience. And I suppose it to, I suppose there's plus and and against do radio play. The against is you have to set all the you know, you have to do all an audio and all that, but then the plus side of it, you don't have to worry about costumes, sets, or anything like that, you know. So, and remember, lads, I suppose Amanda will tell you anyway, read the rules uh, carefully. Make sure that you don't get cut out. Make sure you don't get cut out on rights if you have to pay rights, you know. And just remember that, or like if you're getting plays, maybe from the DLA, or whatever, just make sure that some some rights don't allow you to, to, to put the, the play on, on a social media platform. So just be wary of all them when you are getting plays that you, you can have rights to put it on social media platforms. Obviously, if you're writing your own play, you can you can do what you want with it. All right? So just on, uh, there's a question there uh, for Shane. Um, if anyone wants to take a screenshot of this, it, these are good, uh, these are good uh, places to find radio play scripts, lads. Um, you know, you you find them there. Like there is a there is a couple of websites in America as well. Actually, if you just want to listen to radio plays as well, like um, you, there's a lot of radio plays on YouTube as well. Like in America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they used to do a lot of radio plays. Um, so you know, if you if you type in uh, all time radio plays on YouTube, you'll get a lot of them as well. Like Sorry Wrong Number uh, by Lucy Fleming, The Hitchhiker, all that. You know, Arson Wells. Um, would be in a lot of them, you know, and, and they're, they're good to listen to, you know, just to get a feeling of it, you know, but you'll find a lot of scripts there um, and they're all radio plays, you know, and some of them are free, are actually, you can get the, you can get the script free of charge and there's no rights. Okay. Yeah. And one other thing, if you go into the RTE archives, uh, drama on one on a Sunday night, puts on a radio play basically every Sunday night and the PJ O'Connor Awards, is the annual award for best new radio play in Ireland. So if you go back through the archives of that, you'll see some plays which have later transferred to stage and would be well known at this stage. So it's a good source as well. All right. So is there any questions or do you want to do John Martin's bit first? 
just um, Michael there, Shane was asking about um, getting scripts. I know you have the list up there, um, but is there anything against adjusting the scripts? Is there anything, Ad sorry? Against adjusting the script. Just viewing the scripts, is that? Yeah, no. can, you can you adjust it to suit? No, no. If it's a, if it's a script, lads, that you're, that you're getting, like, you, you, you can't really, I suppose the reason for that is, like, it's, you're infringing on copyrights, so, and it is a kind of, um, it can be a sensitive thing, uh, you know, like there is certain scripts that they're over 100 years old, if the author has passed away, that you can adjust them, but nine times out of 10, the answer would be that if you're getting radio scripts, uh, no, adjusting things here and there, lads, you know, um, word here, but if you want to take out oh, six or seven nights, lines, the answer would be no, it's, it does, it does infringe on copyrights, you know. But, but you would have to do it. Of course, you know, you would have to, yeah, you'd have to get permission from the playwright. But there's a lot of local playwrights as well. You'd be amazed not to get onto your local drama groups. There's playwrights and people in local groups, and they'd be delighted to have their play. And they'd probably give you free reign with it to adjust it, but you just have to run it by them, you know. All right, and As well as that, I suppose the last thing, if you are getting plays from the DLI, like Valerie up at the DLI offices, she's very good to talk to, and she'll, if, if you are looking for maybe one of our plays that can be done on stage and you're wondering if the rights will allow you to, like she's very good that way, like, and she's always very obliging to help those uh, groups, you know? All right, Sinead? And Mairead as well. Mairead in head office has, we have a Mocker trilogy uh, mock books. They're all free copyright as well. Um, so if anybody wants those, you can get on to Mairead and she will send out a copy to you. Is there Any questions? Yeah, feel free to ask questions now. This is... Jeez, I never saw Dara English. <laughs> no, I was trying to unmute Michael. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I just have a couple of questions now. Um, just you were talking earlier about acceptable silences. I think it was yourself, Danny. Like, yeah. at what stage do you think it might get uncomfortable? You know, are you talking like? four or five seconds because obviously in a radio you know five or six seconds like you know what what is an acceptable length of it of a okay silence? <laughs> it depends whether it's pure silence or whether there's a non or that you know I, I would say probably a second longer than feels yeah right. okay you know or maybe a second shorter it depends on the mood of the play okay time. that's fair enough yeah, yeah. thank All you right. and just one other question then um i suppose this Have 